So it is a fact that every vector space has a basis. And we will just look at it in the finite dimensional case. So this is uh, listed as proposition 232 in the book. Any finite dimensional vector space has a basis. And the proof is actually pretty darn trivial. Um, it's almost by definition. So if we take V to be, whoops, um, the span of uh, V1 through Vn, right? And so what am I doing there? I'm actually invoking the hypothesis because saying that it's a finite dimensional vector space, that exactly means that it is equal to the span of some list and lists are by definition finite, right? So I'm just invoking the hypothesis there. Uh, so I've got some spanning set, then V1 through Vm, uh, sorry, N contains a basis um, by the proposition we proved in the, the previous clip, which was numbered 231. That's it, the end, game over. So like I said, pretty darn trivial. Um, now, if V is infinite dimensional, uh, it turns out that it requires something called the axiom of choice. And, and so this is typically referred to as AC. And you've probably come across some mention of the axiom of choice before here or there, maybe in a set theory course, something like that. Um, it, it actually, it turns out that this is uh, is an equivalent form of the axiom of choice, saying that every vector space is, is, uh, has a basis. So it was shown uh, by a guy called Andreas Blas uh, just in 1984, so pretty recently, that um, the statement every vector space has a basis is equivalent to saying that the axiom of choice is true. And so uh, the axiom of choice, I'm not gonna get into it in, in super great detail because we're not gonna need it for this course because we're going to steer away uh, from from issues where it crops up, but it's, it's sort of interesting to know about. So the, the statement, the precise statement of the axiom of choice looks very, um, uh, what's the word, benign, let's say. So it just says, uh, suppose that you have a, a family of sets. So we'll say they're indexed here by i. So this is gonna be So this is going to be a collection of sets. Um, the axiom of choice says that uh, then there's a way to choose an, one element from each of those sets to form a new set. Okay, so you can make it a new set by picking exactly one thing from each SI. And so the way that we do that is, is we describe it as a function. So we say there exists a choice function um, <clears throat> and we'll say we'll call it C for choice and so it's got a coordinate for every I right so in other words this this is uh, you can so you can think of this as as a function um, Uh, from sh shoot, let me see. So it assigns, I guess this is uh, the Cartesian product of all the SIs 
ja. Ähm, okay. And so, oh, I, and I forgot to say sort of the important part, and that is the the thing that you choose from the ith one has to come from the ith set. Okay, so, so to give you an example, if we go back to that goofy way of looking at R3 that I described uh, before when we started talking about how, how functions and uh, sequences are, are just like um, uh, the lists that we see in, in uh, or you know, the finite vector space. Blah. Blarg! Okay, start over. Um, when I tried to show you that vectors in the classical sense as n tuples of numbers are basically the same thing as functions. So let's see. So if we have a, a point um, in R3, so then the idea is there's like three copies of R3. There's the first one, a second one, and a third one. And uh, so one is getting mapped to maybe this point here, and two is getting mapped to this point here, and three is getting mapped to this point here. And so I've chosen a real number for each of those three coordinates, one, two, and three, right? So that's what I mean by, by choosing. Okay, so this axiom of choice thing is, is fairly reasonable, uh, definitely in the case when the index set is finite or even countable. It's when it gets uncountable and maybe when it's like not even a linearly ordered set that it gets a little hairy. Um, and people uh, have strong feelings about it because uh, on the one hand it seems perfectly reasonable and you want to say that in, in certain situations, like say you have uh, an infinite number of sets uh, and each one of them uh, contains like a, a pair of shoes, right? Then you want to be able to say, well, um, okay, then I'm going to make my choice by just taking uh, all of the left ones. Right? And you think, well, that should be a reasonable thing to do. I should be able to talk about like all the left shoes. Okay, fine. Um, but then it leads you to some uh, very strange and, and awkward consequences. So, for ex I don't even know what I drew there. Forget that. Um, so, for example, um, there's the ex it, it implies the existence of non-measurable sets. So sets for which it's impossible to describe a coherent mechanism for gauging what their size should be in some way, area, length, volume, whatever. Uh, can't do it. Um, there's also um, uh, the existence of the banach tarski uh, uh, paradox, which says that you can take a sphere and, so here's a sphere, and you can uh, cut it up into uh, a number of pieces, I think five pieces in some way. And then you can take these pieces and you know, maybe applying a rotation and uh, you know, a shift and whatever else, uh, but just rigid motions. Uh, you can reassemble that sphere and make two identical spheres uh, the same size and shape as the first. And a lot of people go, wait, no, can't do that. Um, so it's it's not actually, I mean, it's, it's logically coherent. There's no fault in it, but people call it a paradox because it just seems to clash with intuition. And before I stop talking about this esoteric topic, I just wanted to say that the um, axiom of choice has, has many different equivalent forms. In fact, there's like a couple of books devoted to just cataloging the different forms of the uh, axiom of choice that, that you run across. Um, one of the most popular is the Hausdorff maximality principle or maximal principle. And so in this one, it says that uh, every partially ordered set has a maximal totally ordered subset.
So remember, a partial order is maybe something like um, uh, inclusion. It might be the case that you have sets A and B and that uh, neither A is contained in B uh, nor is B contained in A. That can happen. You might have, you know, things like this. Um, the point about totally ordered means that uh, any pair of things are comparable. So one of those two order relations will hold for it. And so you can see um, how that might be useful for proving that every vector space has a basis, for example. There's also another very uh, similar form called Zorn's lemma. Um, and it is not a lemma uh, because it is equivalent to an axiom, right? So the whole point about it being called the axiom of choice is it's not something that can be proven from the, the standard assumptions of, of set theory. So Zorn's lemma is actually an axiom, not a, not a lemma. But poor Zorn, he was a little bit mistaken. Um, <clears throat> there's also... Tarski's theorem. And so Tarski's theorem, also not a theorem, it's an axiom, is that for uh, every infinite set A, um, there's a bijection from A to the Cartesian of product of A with itself. And this is very closely related to something which is maybe even a, a little bit simpler, which is simply the statement that every, uh, whoops, surjective function has a right inverse. And so that means just that if if f is a function from x to y, then there ex and, it, and it's surjective, then there exists some h from y to x such that uh, the composition f of h is the identity function on y. So that's what a right inverse is. A left inverse means you, you can compose it with um, uh, on you compose it on the on the left side of f instead, but this is a right inverse. Okay. Um. Yeah. And 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 so um, you can actually see pretty closely um, how how this formulation relates to the the definition of of the axiom of choice I gave you in the beginning. Whoops, bad color. Um, if you think of f as being a surjective function, and then you take the functions that you're interested in to be the preimages of the points. So if I take the preimage of that guy there, and the preimage of that guy there, and the preimage of that guy there, then <coughs> selecting one thing from each of those non-empty sets, well, that gets us. Um, right back to this year.